Uh, so I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Gregory Wilson. He's the director of the National Centre for Photovoltaics at the National Renewable Energy Laboratories in Golden, Colorado. Um, it's, we've had many partnerships and activities between our institution um, and many Australian institutions and and, um, and NREL over, over many years. Um, and Greg's uh, a chemical engineer, but he's all right. And, um, <laughs> and he's... Uh, He's a fairly recent, uh, three and a half years. Two and a half years. He's been at NRL. Um, spent most of his working life in, in industry and, and particularly, or most notably, in a, in a silicon materials company, uh, MEMC, which is a, a Monsanto company that originally. Um, and, and bringing that experience. So, so the group he came to is, is one that isn't, um, that has sort of put silicon or wafer silicon to one side, um, un unlike our own place here. And um, we're, we're very happy to have him spend a couple of days with us and, and talking about what we can do together with our um, Australian Centre of Advanced Photovoltaics and, and various US institutions, and especially NREL. And um, we're hoping this will be a, a step to deepening the relationship and, and doing more and more together. So I'll get off the soapbox and, and let Greg have had a chance to tell us a little about what they've been doing. All right. Thanks, Richard. Uh, thanks, everyone. Just so that I don't go over time, why don't you give me some boundary conditions here? So it's five after the hour? Yes, we need to be out by the hour. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. So thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm going to attempt to drive this thing up here. Um, so. What I want to try to do is, I'm not going to go deep in any one topic, there's not enough time for it. I'm just going to give a, an overview of, of what we do, the PV program, and as Richard's pointed out, uh, I've been, a, a, I guess, maybe a bit of a maverick at, uh, at NREL because I am from the silicon world, not from the PV world. Uh, initially, I'm from the integrated circuit world, but uh, MEMC acquired a, 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 a PV company, so I've been in PV now for about 10 years. Um, so let me just give you a, a little taste of what we do. So the National Center for Photovoltaics is where I'm from. I'm the director of that center. Um, in the U.S., it, uh, it's the largest and the oldest. It goes, I'll show you in a second, goes back to 1977. So we're funded by the U.S. Department of Energy uh, to do uh, both basic materials and device work and applied work in PV. We, and we also include reliability. I'm going to tell you a few things about that here in a minute. What drives everything in the U.S., if you're funded by the Department of Energy, is this goal that I've shown here on the bottom. It's called the Sunshot Goal. It's a clever name, but it really is just a, a fossil fuel equivalence goal for LCOE, for PV. But uh, a lot of what we're doing, if I use this thing, is really about this. A dollar per watt installed, but at the module level, 50 U.S. cents per watt. What's most important, though, is, is, is that gets you to here, an LCOE that in the United States is equivalent to fossil fuel generation cost, about five to six cents a kilowatt hour. So in every award uh, since 2012 from the DOE and the PV program, this has got to be part of your proposal. So you, you, you hear a lot about it in the United States. So we started in 1977, and Martin, you started three years before that. Um, so uh, it, it's been a lot of fun for me after spending uh, 27 years in industry, coming to a national lab is, uh, is a lot of fun, uh, challenging sometimes because industry and national labs don't operate the same way. But in 1977, NREL was actually not NREL, it was the Solar Energy Research Institute right up here. So that was at the, uh, the it was in the midst of the Arab oil embargo. And, and uh, there was a great worry in the West and in many countries that were fossil fuel dependent but what they were going to do for their own energy security. So that's what started it in 1977. And then there was SIGS and there was CIS and CADTEL. In 1991, though, the U.S. Congress created a national laboratory out of Siri. And that's when NREL was born. But it was actually, the, the lab actually grew out of what is my center today, which was the old Siri group. And by then, you can see that I'm going to sh paint out the classic NREL efficiency curve, which a lot of you guys have seen this champion efficiency chart, but it's a nice little cartoon maybe for showing the history. And so by 
1991, you know, you can see what's happening with the three fives there. They're kind of taking off, and you see a lot of UNSW points here on the, on the crystal and silicon curve, and the CIS and CAD TEL ones are continuing to progress. In 1996, the Department of Energy actually created my center. And um, we can talk later about what a national center really means, but it, it, it's changed a lot since 1996. But still, the name remains uh, the same. And, 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 and really, we are still the, the point of uh, most of the PV work that's done in the United States. And then, so here we are today. I'll talk about the, the champion cell efficiency curve here. I know, I'm going to assume, because of the size of this institution here, most of you have some knowledge of PV, but I'm not going to go too deep. This is not really a PV specialist talk. But uh, I probably will use some PV terms. Uh, if you don't understand, please do stop me. I don't want to confuse anyone. But this, there's been remarkable progress over 37 years, and I want to talk about it more here in a minute. So today, this is what NREL actually looks like today. Uh, if, you, if you get the chance to come to Golden, Colorado, which is just to the west of Denver, it's really a, a, really a delightful place. Um, and the buildings that we occupy, I'm going to circle them here so if I can get the mouse working. That building right there is the, the building I'm in. That's the Solar Energy Research Facility. It's this building. That's where, that was our original lab about 22 years ago. Um, this building is our newest lab. It's about seven years old. It's called the Science and Technology Facility, and they're, 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 they're together. So all of the PV materials and device work goes on in these two buildings. But we have another building down here, which is our outdoor test facility. So for those of you that are involved in reliability work, module le level performance work, we do that work down there. And then we have another large outdoor test facility that, uh, that we participate in, participate in in Greater uh, Denver. It's out by the Denver airport. It's a facility called SolarTAC. So we have a, a lot of things there. Um, and uh, this little cartoon here is maybe the better way to describe that. Really, the NCPV is kind of a uh, one-stop shop, if you will, to use kind of that American phrase. It's kind of everything PV because we have all the conversion technology work over here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. But then we have cross-cutting work. We have m module reliability. It's one of our maybe most known international activities now because of international standards work that Sarah Kurtz and others are involved with. Uh, we have our measurement and characterization group, and within this is uh, a lot of folks know Keith Emery, who Keith has been doing cell and module characterizations for, uh, I think Keith's been at NREL around 34 years, a good long while. So we've kind of got everything covered, and in the U.S., this is, uh, this is unique. There's a lot of great institutions in the United States these days doing PV work, but none has quite the span that we do. So just a quick summary of all the things we're doing is on this slide. So today, um, our funded research, I'm going to show you in these two slides, uh, just generally, we have a 3-5 multi-junction group that goes back well over 25 years. And what we're working on today in this group, if I can get the mouse to work again, is, uh, is, is continuing to move the champion cell efficiencies. And the goals now are around 50%. Actually, our goal is a better than 50% four-junction device that we're working on. We have started silicon work again. So as Richard said, uh, a silicon guy came in and uh, we have restarted silicon work and um, we've taken on the, the problem, one of the problems that a lot of folks here are working on, which is a silicon tandem. The reason we chose that problem to start with is we have a lot of experience in three fives and we have a lot of experience with multi-junctions. So it was a, it was a good entry point and a, and a leveraging point. Historically, we've been in CAD TEL for a very long time, but interestingly, up until around the time I came, some of the fundamental materials problems really had not been addressed. You know, where are the carriers going? Why is the lifetime so poor? So we've got here uh, fundamental questions that are being uh, asked and, and actually being answered. And uh, the goal really, I would simply state it, would be to, to have 16% high volume, that I'm using a semiconductor often used acronym there, HVM, high volume manufacturing. We've been trying to help uh, the one manufacturer that's at scale uh, get to a 16% module. Um, honestly, they probably don't need us that much anymore because they're making fantastic progress on their own. 
We're doing the same thing in CIS and in SIGS. Um, it, it really trying to answer the fundamental questions about how to get the carrier density up, uh, what's happening to your carriers, what's the role of defects, what's happening at grain boundaries. That generally characterizes all of our work in multicrystalline thin films. We have an OPV program. It's actually a pretty large program and it leverages uh, another kind of special thing about a U.S. national lab. There's actually two different parts of DOE that provide funding. <coughs> One, excuse me, is the the, the office of DOE that funds us, it's called EERE, -E, and that stands for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it covers almost everything that we do at NREL, but it's also where all the PV program work is at. But we also have the Office of Science, which funds basic research in the United States, materials, chemistry, research. There's a very active program at NREL that, is, that stops short of, of a device, but funds basic chemistry, material science work. So this OPV program that we have really leverages uh, BES that you see here. BES stands for Basic Energy Sciences. That's part of the Office of Science portfolio. So we've got this good fortune of having this fundamental work that's being funded by another part of DOE, and we can leverage that, and we're really focused on OPV devices. Here's four other things we're doing, which kind of is a little, these are kind of a little on the periphery, but still important. We've got a CZTS activity uh, that's uh, now about four years old. Uh, so this is the earth abundant analog to SIGs. This is copper, zinc, uh, tin sulfide or selen uh, selenide. And here again, it's really a polycrystalline thin film activity. Um, we're doing some work with, with, with some folks here on growing CZTS on silicon. But this is really about a, a polycrystalline thin film absorber and trying to develop an earth abundant alternative, if you will, to SIGs. The next one is a new thing that we've started that actually is very closely tied to our long history in three fives. We've started a, uh, a program that's about three years old to develop a new reactor for depositing the three fives. So those of you that have worked in three fives are familiar with uh, MOCVD, metal organic chemical vapor deposition. Um, I've been around the three fives for a long time myself and, and, and really believe these are the best possible PV absorbers you could come up with, but the cost of depositing these materials is too high. The MOCVD precursors are too expensive and the growth rates are too slow. So there's an old growth technique called hydride vapor phase epitaxy. It goes back to the 70s and we've resurrected it. So I'm going to show you a slide later about that, but uh, it's an interesting activity. Uh, uh, we've already demonstrated a growth rate that's about 100 times faster than MOCVD growth rates. Um, we're also working on novel PV absorbers. We have this, this activity funded by the Office of Science, which is shown here. The acronym is an EFRC. I'm going to apologize in advance for all the acronyms. The U.S. government is rich in acronyms. And um, um, I, it's apparently rubbed off on me after two and a half years, so I use these things seamlessly. EFRC stands for the Energy Frontier Research Centers. It's a, uh, a, a series of centers that the Department of Energy set up to do fundamental, fundamental uh, energy materials research. NREL won one of these, and it's uh, called the Center for Inverse Design. It uses high-speed computing to search for uh, PV absorbers and other PV materials that have not yet been synthesized. And uh, most of the work is actually fed directly into our OPV work. We've now got a library of several thousand uh, organic molecules that are, uh, at least theoretically, very good PV absorbers, uh, but they've not been synthesized, nor has a, has a device been made out of them. We're also using that, though, for the inorganic PV absorbers. So this is really what this work here is about. This novel PV absorber work is really looking for new PV absorbers on the inorganic side of the ledger. And then we're doing the same thing, really, with new, new contacts new uh, uh, transparent conducting conductive oxides. All right, so I said a lot just then about, about conversion technologies, the search for absorbers, uh, d d perfecting devices, but we also do a lot of reliability. And in fact, there's so much going on in reliability, it, it's, it's kind of impossible to squeeze it into one slide. Um, the other nice thing about, about NREL is we have some pretty well-known and very uh, high-impact people, and one of those people is uh, Sarah Kurtz and she runs our PV reliability group now. Um, we've got a lot of different projects going on. I've just thrown three up here quickly. But on the left side, 
is a publication that just came out that's related to the international standards work, uh, something that Sarah felt very strongly about called Qualification Plus, trying to push qualification tests for modules well beyond kind of the normal accepted limits. Uh, really the idea here is that PV is going to have to have automotive industry-like reliability. Um, we can't have massive failures in the field with PV and expect this industry to survive. Uh, Sarah's passionate about this and is trying to lead uh, a large group of people, I'm sure many, uh, a few people from UNSW are, are uh, attached to this, that's really uh, aiming to try to set higher international standards for PV testing. So there's a lot more that you can find out about on all of these things on our website, uh, but I've listed the, uh, the, the link just for Sarah's work uh, down there at the bottom. So let me press on. So one of the things, probably the biggest thing that motivated me to leave the private sector and come to NREL is really all crammed into this slide. I am an amateur climate change uh, follower because of the numerical work I used to do. I'm fascinated by multi-physics, mixed physics problems. And uh, I'm certainly one of a whole lot of people these days that believe that, that PV is one of the very important technologies. It's growing organically and is an immediately deployable solution to the climate change problem. Um, Australia and the United States have kind of similar oscillations in terms of uh, what our governments think about climate change. Um, but uh, there's a large scientific community in the United States that is absolutely clear that we've got a big problem, and it's in this red box over here. We've got uh, 7 billion people using 21 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity. Two-thirds of that around the world comes from fossil fuels. Um, and we have a planet that is just uh, now nudging its way over 400 part per million CO2. Uh, you've got lots and lots of data from lots of different labs showing the impact of all of this. But uh, many people believe, and I'm certainly one of them, that we have to move to zero carbon energy sources as rapidly as possible. But because I've spent my life in industry, I do believe that uh, PV is one of these that is not going to require big push. It's growing organically and uh, we all know that. In fact, I'll show you some slides here in a minute on just how rapidly it's growing. But why, uh, why do I think that PV is, is such a big deal? I know many of you think it is a big deal, but when I talk to non-PV specialists, I try to give them an idea of just how much energy is in the solar resource. Most lay people do not have an appreciation for this. So what I'm showing you here is a solar resource map of the United States. Um, here's Alaska, uh, here's Germany, there's Spain. The, the unit down here at the bottom is kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. Uh, I am originally probably from St. Louis, Missouri in the middle of the United States, but I now live in Denver. Look at the solar resource over here, it's very rich. It's on the order of 1,300 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So if you do the simple exercise of, of, of going out and looking at what the forecasts are for total Earth's energy needs in 2035, you can go out and get that in a number of places. And then you go out and say, well, what could I do today with technology that's available today? How big of a solar field would I need to power the Earth? And so a nice little academic exercise is that. It's, uh, under the 2035 new policy scenario uh, published by the, uh, the uh, IEA, um, using 20% modules on two axis trackers, using solar resource data available from mineral, this is just a calculation done with PV watts, which is on our website. It would be a fictitious field 428 miles on a side. And if you could convert all of that to fuel without any losses, that covers transport. This is just a simple calculation of the total amount of energy that Earth needs. Of course it's unrealistic. We, we, we have darkness, we don't have storage, we can't convert it to fuels, but many people do not realize how rich this resource is. It's, a, it's an amazing resource. And it's not just in the United States. We have a rich resource in India. The scales on these two maps are the same. That's India, that's China. I didn't, I didn't have time uh, to, to put it, I should have put Australia in here. You have a very good resource here in Australia. So the point I like to try to make to people who are not familiar with, with how much energy is in the sun, of course that is our source of energy for planet Earth, there's a lot of energy there. Okay, so what's happening with PV? Demand is growing nicely, roughly speaking. The forecast for 2017 would be roughly doubling uh, where we were in 2012, a, a 50, you know, five-ish to 60 gigawatt market um, in, in 2017. I just happened to grab here this is from Green Tech Media Research. 
because I used to work for Sun Edison, MEMC Sun Edison, we had lots of marketing people doing this sort of things. But you know, you, you, you find that they all converge on, on roughly the same answer. We've got really steady growth now. And even during the, the, the kind of the troubled period between 2010 and 2013, there was still, still growth. But if you go back to the World Energy Outlook from IEA uh, and look at what it projects, how much PV is going to contribute to the world energy pie uh, by 2035, it's actually that right there. They're projecting only 7%. And if you um, are a, a follower like I am that, that PV is an important tool to use for climate change, that's not nearly enough. So the question that I like to ask is, what do we have to do to make PV really the big, the really big generator? It ha we have this great solar resource, so what do we have to do to make it the big generator? So there's a lot of things that need to be done. Fortunately, a lot of things that already have to be done. But here's some simple statements down here at the bottom. We do have to continue uh, to get the cost down. And a, a, a ton of progress has been made. I'm going to show you a little bit about what is a, a barrier in the United States now. But having this fossil fuel equivalent target for the levelized cost of energy is, to speaking from my industrial experience, this is an important lever. We've got to address intermittency. Lots of people are working on intermittency, but it is a big problem. You know, the sun goes down, clouds come. So we have to, f we have to solve the storage problem. There's a lot I could talk to you about that's going on in the United States, funded by DOE, to try to address the intermittency problem, really on two fronts. Uh, storage, which is the holy grail of, of, of a solution, if you will, but also how to optimize uh, the existing grids. And I'll show you in a minute that NREL has studied that for, for a number of years and thinks that total grid PV penetration can be much higher than what it is today. And then we've just got the barriers to scaling PV at the terawatt scale. Um, and you have to start thinking about how capital intensive a particular technology is. How much, how earth abundant are the materials? How much of the materials do you waste? Uh, how much CO2 do you put out in the atmosphere just to put a PV array out there? So energy payback time, all of these things are important. We have made remarkable progress with PV. This is the, the, the experience curve. There's a lot of different forms of this. Um, but you know, this just shows average uh, module prices as a function of capacity, but also time. And you can see that it's on a trajectory to hit this red dash line, which is that sunshot goal. And in fact, 50 cent per watt modules have been on the market now for a while, in at least the last two years or so. I would argue, though, that some of that is due to supply demand imbalance, which is another factor. You know, there's always macroeconomics. You know, it, it really is true that when you have something in excess supply, the price is going to fall, and that is what hap has happened with PV. But fortunately, there have been real uh, uh, substantial cost reductions in the supply chain for silicon, but also these same things have been happening in the thin films. So we'll talk about that here in a minute as well. So, what is going on? Uh, SunPower doesn't like to talk about their projections, but they do give these figures, put these figures out that don't have uh, any uh, any real numbers on them. SunPower does believe they're going to meet the 50 cent per watt module goal, even at their higher efficiencies. Um, First Solar, this is from their 2013 um, um, Capital Markets Day. So publicly traded companies do these things all over the world. They have days where they entertain their investors and they give a lot of information and. You know, for those of us that have a science and technology bias, you, know, you have to look at that with some skepticism because they're trying to get investors excited. But there's also a lot of times some, some good truths in there. Um, so First Solar believes that they're going to surpass this uh, sunshot goal in fiscal 16. Um, I think that they might. I think SIGS is probably going to do it as well. This is a recent announcement from First Solar. Uh, we tested a 17% panel uh, from them. So what's happening on the thin film side is that um, getting to 15% panel efficiencies uh, with roughly the same cost structure that the thin film companies have had, they're, they're approaching it. In fact, they're there. Uh, I get to see some of these companies. I get to see some of the manufacturing lines. And 16% modules are just right around the corner. Um, and so if they can keep their cost down, that will be a, that will be a, a, a big benefit. And of course, these companies think that they'll be able to take some silicon market share. Where will they take it? They'll, they'll go after the multi-crystalline silicon low end uh, the, uh, of, of the market in terms of efficiency. But the beauty of silicon is you can just keep moving up the efficiency scale and keep pushing the cost down. So the way I see our world is 
11% or 10% modules, which were the norm from, say, First Solar a few years ago, are going to be displaced by 16% modules in a year or so that already meet this cost per watt module goal. So that all sounds great, but look what's happening in the United States. What really matters is the total system cost. And so this is a, uh, some data just showing residential and commercial systems. The total system cost, and I've got a couple different countries listed, the big wide bar over here is the United States. So we've got a, another problem to solve in the United States. We have, uh, we have elevated soft costs. We have the cost of kind of everything else, permitting, actually putting the array on the roof, all, a lot of other costs that are elevated. And it's because our market is, is just not very well developed and we've got 50 different states and 50 different regulatory environments. And we have a lot of inexperience with the installers. So the DOE now is pouring a lot of money into this and I would assert that our module prices are quickly approaching the goals we need. The other aspects of the system cost picture, uh, pressures being applied, at least in the United States, I, I'm, I'm rather confident that that problem too will be solved. So what are the big issues then to deal with in order to kind of enable this terawatt future? And certainly in my laboratory, we're, we're now believing that we need to work on high efficiency down here at the bottom, and we need to work on new processes and materials that will further lower the cost. So we're now talking about the beyond sunshot goals. And so we've got a strategy for what we're going to do in the next 10 years. And just let me give you a few highlights of, of what that might be. First, though, I do want to just pause again. This is the, I think, Martin, this is our latest efficiency chart. Uh, we, we, there's, the Panasonic data is not on here yet. Panasonic just had a 25.6% sell. Um, that uh, has been verified. But if you just kind of circle the big areas, that's what's happened with 3-5 multi-junctions in the last, say, 15 years. Um, there's also on here something I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more, which is one sun devices in 3-5s. So it's had some pretty good progress. Uh, that champion cell is 31.1. Um, there's where the thin films are at. They've been more or less flat for a long time. But if you look right here, this is all sorts of fun, interesting stuff that was going on between First Solar and General Electric, uh, GE, when they had Prime Star up until about a year ago. It was a, kind of a tit-for-tat race, and uh, so there's been a lot of uh, improvements in champion cell efficiencies on, on, uh, on Cantel. Um, you know, there, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, we're, we're close, really, uh, with, within just jumping distance of the shock equator limit almost for silicon, but there's still some room there, and there's continues to be improvements. So SunPower and, and Panasonic are both kind of leading the way on, on what I call Chakralski silicon PV. And then, you know, thin absorbers. I, I like to make the point, certainly in the United States, that uh, we can be more efficient with the, amount, with the polysilicon that we use. I have a, a lot of history making poly and dealing with the silicon supply chain. And so uh, one of the things I think we're going to have to deal with at some point is getting the efficiency of silicon devices way up or figuring out how not to waste half of the silicon. And we waste half of the silicon when we cut up an ingot with a saw. Uh, that produces kerf, and that kerf is useless because of the metals that are on it. Um, so here's just a short list, five things here that, that, at least in our lab, we think are kind of the important research fronts. So I just want to say a couple things about each, and uh, then I'll, I'll try to get done and so we can have some time for questions. High efficiency thin films. Uh, we've been working on this for about, I would say, three years on top of a 25-year history of working on thin films, but really trying to figure out what's happening with carrier lifetime. How do you dope these materials? Because by and large, they, no one's really succeeded in doing that. Um, so I'll, I'll say a few words about this in a minute. We also have a silicon tandem project, and so I'll talk to you just very superficially about what we're doing on tandems. Um, I want to show you a little bit more about low-cost one-junction and two-junction one-sun three-fives. And that involves this reactor, but I also, excuse me, want to mention some of the other barriers for the three-fives, which are a big barrier, big issue is substrate reuse. The gallium arsenide wafer has to be reused. Um, because of my history, I'm very much a believer that kerfless silicon in some form has to emerge in order to really allow silicon to, to kind of go to the next level. So I'll make a couple of comments about that. And then, of course, we're all excited. If you're following PV, all excited about what's happening with perovskite. So I think every, every lab in the world that's working on PV now has tried to start a perovskite effort. 
and, and we've already got uh, some pretty amazing devices. So let me just start uh, talking a little bit about each one of these. There's a lot of information on this slide and it's kind of intentionally vague, but uh, really the point that I want to make here is, broadly speaking, we need to figure out what's happening with the carriers. Um, uh, we need to understand where they're going. So with all the polycrystalline materials, you've got defects within the grains, you've got things happening at the grains. And over here in the lower right, uh, there's no way you can read that, I can't even read it here, but a, a lot of what we've been doing for the last two or three years is studying the recombination activity at various grain boundaries. And so we've characterized the different grain boundaries and uh, we now know which ones are benign and which ones aren't. And uh, if you know that, you might be able to manipulate the uh, process in order to get one versus the other. But we've also been working on doping. Uh, doping for, for all of these materials is important. So you want to get the, you want to get the carrier concentration up and then you want to lose fewer carriers. And you, so you want, you want a longer lifetime material. So that, you know, in a nutshell, describes what we're doing in, in all of these. That would, for us, that would be SIGS, uh, CZTS, um, and CADTEL, but also some of the other polycrystalline kind of new PV absorber work we're doing. While we're trying to find some of these new materials, we're also looking at how they behave in terms of what happens at the grain boundaries, for, for instance. On silicon, um, so our goals and the goals that, uh, you know, that Martin's described for me uh, here are, are pretty similar. I, I think all of us know that we need a 1.7 EV or maybe a little higher top cell. Uh, if you're going to grow this epitaxially, um, you need it to be lattice matched to silicon so we don't have a lot of misfit dislocations growing. If we're going to grow it epitaxially, it's going to be a high temperature process so we have to have the coefficient of thermal expansion to be matched so they don't warp the wafer when we bring it out of the, out of the reactor. Again, we need that band gap to be right and has to have the right optical properties. A lot of people are excited about perovskites and we are too. So, so we're also, we also have a perovskite on silicon activity. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details because a lot of it's new and it's not published, but we've got about five different things we're working on that generally involve a combination of, of, uh, of new materials for the top cell. Um, but we've also, I think I've got a slide here. Yeah, I do. Let me keep going. I, we also have a, a bonding activity that we started. So I think all of you know this, but again, when I'm talking to an audience that, that, that uh, doesn't have uh, PV experts in it, it's important to, to remind them that the sun isn't a laser. It's not a single wavelength, so we have a spectrum. So the beauty of multi-junctions is you can, you, can, you can grab independent parts of the, of the spectrum. And this is just a plot that shows you, just generally, you know, what you get with multiple junctions and what kind of cell efficiencies you can get. And we've been doing this for concentrators for a long time. What, uh, and also we've been, we've been making um, uh, one Sun 3.5 champion cells. We actually made a one Sun gallium arsenide cell about 20 years ago that I think was uh, in the, around 25 percent. So it's, it's not hard to do that. We did it a long time ago. This is a recent record. It's a two junction. Uh, this one's uh, in gap on gas. It's a 31.1 percent cell. So that kind of begs the question here. Um, if you were going to use layer transfer, if you could really crack that nut, um, you could have a silicon triple. Um, and so how would you do this? Well, you could use selective area growth. There's a lot of techniques for, for doing this. In the silicon IC business, there's been a lot of work over the years to try to integrate 3.5s with silicon. Uh, with the, the folks working on gallium nitride for LEDs, for blue LEDs, there's a number of techniques for how you, how you can basically create uh, uh, nanostructures that allow um, the dislocations to thread out to an edge. So you can imagine something like that, um, but you can also imagine layer transfer. So we're beginning to explore that. Uh, Fraunhofer ESA had a nice paper on a, on a layer transferred cell that I think was a little over 30 percent. So there's a lot of activity here on this front and uh, I think a lot of smart people will, will move the needle on this. What excites me is really what uh, I put in this first bullet. The routes to this to this kind of two junction or three junction um, device with silicon commodity, silicon Chakrowski wafer cell at the bottom. I would argue that the semiconductor industry has shown us the way. We've got heteroepitaxial routes, we've got layer transfer or wafer bonding routes that at least have been demonstrated. So the challenge is getting the cost out. 
Um, semiconductor IC technologies work, but they're way too expensive for PV. So I think a lot of what the community has got to do is uh, written down here, to engineer the cost out of these IC-oriented techniques. All right, so next slide is about the uh, HVPE work we're doing and, and generally one Sun 3.5 devices. So uh, I think I've already made this statement. MLCVD remains too expensive uh, for high volume one Sun, three, uh, one Sun cell production. There's a U.S. startup that has now been uh, bought by the Chinese company Hanergy. That company is called Alta Devices. They were bought by Hanergy in December. And uh, it was a fantastic little company. A lot of DOE money went into helping, helping them get that technology prepared. Um, but but uh, I think that for those of us that were following that company, they've really um, probably proven that the, the, the MLCVD issues are real. But there's another issue that's very real, and that is, that is wafer reuse. Uh, figuring out how to reuse a wafer many, many times. In the case of a 3.5 PV cell, we're probably talking about recycling a gallium arsenide wafer uh, maybe four or five hundred times. When I say recycling, I'm not talking about using the gallium arsenide wafer as a growth template, as a seed for growing gallium arsenide for the, for the device. Or you can imagine if you're going to use, say, ion implantation, you could ion implant and cleave it off. But either way, that wafer's got to be reused. It's your source. So that is a troublesome problem in manufacturing. I'm not going to address it here. But again, the semiconductor industry has actually thought about a lot of this, and there's a reasonable amount of manufacturing experience that underlies that. And it's in the world I used to live in, which is uh, making silicon insulator wafers, which is a layer transferred wafer that's used at the high end of, of uh, logic devices. So this slide and what we're primarily focused on right now is developing a reactor that can grow fast and it doesn't require metalloorganic precursors. So this uh, uh, HVPE uh, uses, the, uses the source metals. You create uh, volatile uh, metal chlorides in situ and bring them to the growth surface. That was the whole idea of HVPE 40 years ago. Uh, so our reactor works. Uh, we've already demonstrated growth rates that are 100 times higher. So I'm very uh, anxious to see some publications come out of this work, but it looks very optimistic. Uh, we're now, we've only had it running four weeks and we're trying to get our first device out and try to publish what we can do with it. Um, this is just a very simple statement about silicon. And, and in some ways, what I just talked about, about wafer reuse and, and peeling off a layer, really applies here. So, you know, you guys all know this very well. This is just a, a cartoon depicting the supply chain from uh, metallurgical grade silicon all the way out to a, a working cell. I've spent a lot of time in this part and in this part. And, and as a lot of you know, you, you spend a lot of capital equipment to highly purify uh, uh, metallurgical grade silicon to polysilicon, which at MEMC we're, we were one of the big poly suppliers at one time. A lot of capital goes into that. Uh, it's, one of the, it's really the purest material that, that, that humankind has produced. And yet, when we uh, grow a Tchaikovsky ingot, or even a, a DSS ingot, a multicrystalline ingot, we waste a lot of that when we saw it up with a wire saw. So roughly 50% of the silicon is lost and it's non-recoverable. Lots and lots of effort's been put into trying to figure out how to recover it. There's not really a cost-effective way to do that that uh, at least I've seen. So the idea's been around for a while to just go straight from silane or trichlorosilanes right to uh, an epitaxially grown absorber, actually grow the whole, the whole junction. Uh, but doing that's tricky because, again, we have some of the same issues with wafer reuse. In this case, uh, if you're talking about the Canon LTRAN process, that's an old SOI process that is the basis for uh, the technology of Crystal Solar and for Selexel, two U.S. companies that are approaching this. They're trying to epitaxially grow the, uh, the device on a reusable uh, slice of silicon. But they're working on it, and uh, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic, but it's far from, uh, far from ready to, to go to scale. You have other companies like 1366 in the United States. Um, a gentleman from MIT, Eli Sachs, started that company to directly cast a wafer. And then you've got some other ideas around. There have been people that have tried spalling. Um, haven't got a lot of traction there, but there's still, in my opinion, a lot of work to be done there, and it really is on the engineering front. It's, uh, maybe a lot less attractive as kind of a good science problem because a lot of the what's really going to matter here is just good old engineering to try to take the cost out. So 
Lastly, I want to talk about perovskites, and I don't have to say much. That little circle over there is what's currently on our efficiency chart. If, if, if you guys are following the almost weekly um, uh, uh, paper that's coming out with perovskites, and if you, there was a meeting in Japan a few weeks ago, I, I, I happened to be in Japan right at the end of that meeting, uh, you get a lot of these anecdotal reports about what the next champion cell is going to be, and I heard in Japan it was over 19 percent, but no one has verified that yet, but it might be coming. Um, but it's a fascinating material. This is, the, there, this is, a, this is a hybrid. It's an organic, inorganic uh, lead halide. Um, this is the one we're working with. Uh, so you've got, if I get my mouse working, so you've got an organic group, uh, a, 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 a methyl ammonia group on the, on the corners of this thing. You've got lead down here in the center, and then you've got the halides at the corners here. Um, it's a fascinating material. A lot of people are trying to understand it. We do a lot of theory work at NREL, so we've got our theorists trying to understand why this material behaves. And for a lot of those folks that have been working on that Center for Inverse Design and the modeling work we've been doing for organic uh, PV absorbers, I think there's generally a belief that if we figure out how to make this material work, it might be an important window uh, into what may, be, what may be possible with a whole class of materials that are, that are remarkable PV absorbers. The fact that this has just come out of nowhere and we've already got a 16% champion cell is, is really noteworthy. So there's a, there's, it's, it's, it's reasonable that a lot of people are excited about it. All right, just a couple of comments before I close. Renewable intermittency. Uh, this is a big problem, whether it's wind. The wind can sometimes fail. I live in the state of Colorado. Uh, we get as much as 50% of our electricity from wind power now. Uh, and we have a lot of PV on a lot of rooftops in Colorado. So what happens when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? You've, the utility has a problem. They have to somehow spin up their, their generators in time to keep the electricity on. In 2012, NREL put out a study called the Renewable Electricity Future Study. And um, this was written for the U.S. market, but it's a general statement of what's possible with, with technology that's really power management technology. There was very little in here about storage, but yet the conclusion it reached that with effort, we could get to 80% renewables around the world at, at utilities. Um, I'm a, a little bit of a, of a kind of a Silicon Valley guy in the way I think because I've spent so much time out there. And there's a, there's a lot of people that are very excited about another approach to this which is uh, storage, low-cost storage. And so in the United States, for sure, you see, depending on where you live, if you live in California, if you live in Colorado, we have a lot of electric vehicles now. Um, Nissan Leafs and other vehicles, uh, uh, plug-in Prius, uh, Toyota Priuses. I own two hybrid cars, so we have lithium-ion batteries everywhere. Well, there's, a, there's an entrepreneur from the Bay Area that's pretty well known worldwide. He, he, he's the, the guy that started SpaceX, the commercial space company that's putting rockets up for NASA. Um, he owns, uh, he started Solar, Solar City, which is a, a big solar installer now in California, and he owns Tesla. His name's Elon Musk. He's an interesting guy, and he's got this plan for building what he calls the Gigafactory for lithium-ion batteries. And it is, it is humorous in a way, but what's interesting to me historically, I'm kind of a, uh, it's fascinating how technologies move. So Henry Ford was the Elon Musk of his day, uh, and he decided to build a great big automobile factory. And the net result was automobiles came down to the price of the working man. The average worker could actually afford a car. And so Elon Musk has this grand vision, and he's actually wealthy enough and influential enough that he might do it. And I'm fascinated about this because I've been a big believer that, that completely autonomous homes, autonomous neighborhoods, completely disconnected from the electrical grid is our future. And I've got a lot of, we all have a lot of colleagues in Germany that absolutely believe this, that, this is, that the utility industry as we know it is being upended. And so when you consider, this is my summary, I am done, but when you consider that we have this climate change challenged world and you consider the wealth creating opportunities of a lot of these technologies, uh, we have the potential to really reduce our carbon output and at the same time transform much like the transformation that occurred, you know, when we, we all carry around what was, when I used to work in this technology, these little devices are basically a supercomputer from 30 years ago. And we all carry them away, around and throw them away every three years. So the future of the utility business is going to change. And it could be like wireless communications where a lot of the world just skipped the wireless network. A lot of people are very, very interested in what the future of energy looks like. 
Energy, though, is different than semiconductors. It's different than consumer electronic devices because it's highly regulated around the world. Every civilized country has a highly regulated utility industry to keep the power on. Uh, we all want fuel for our cars. We all drive them. We have to have fuel for our airplanes and our ships. So what does the, the new world of energy look like? Well, electricity could be big, a big, big part of it. And so there's a lot of people in the United States thinking and dreaming about what it could be. So I guess the other points I want to make just in summary, there really has been remarkable progress. This university here has been part of that progress over the last 20 years. A lot of other great institutions have. And, you know, and NREL's played a, a role too. PV conversion technologies have moved dramatically. Silicon is going to continue to be the big player. Silicon, silicon always wins. I say this at NREL and people you know, rise up in their chairs you know, because uh, sil uh, NREL, my center, was a, was a, was a, was a thin film place. But you know, silicon always wins. Silicon beat out much better semiconductors for the IC business for a lot of different reasons. And it'll continue to win a big part of the market in PV. But it won't be the only conversion technology, but it's going to continue to be a really big one. The polycrystal and thin films will chew out, carve out a little bit of the market for themselves. How big will all depend on how quickly you know, one can get their, their efficiency and cost down versus multicrystal and silicon. So it'll be interesting to see what happens at the lower efficiency end of silicon. But like I said, PV uh, is really the solution that a lot of policymakers need right now for this, this world that's increasingly troubled and challenged by climate change. A lot of good reports have been coming out of the IPCC group in the last few weeks, if you've been following them, they've actually been getting mainstream press in the United States, which uh, is encouraging for me because the political discussion in the United States may be slightly shifting to a less, uh, uh, it may, may be less misinformation and a little bit more logic being applied. The United States has been troubled by a lot of things, uh, a lot of storms, a lot of strange things are happening. Whether they can be directly tied to climate change or not, at least it's changing the, the political discourse slowly. So, that's where we're at. Moving, moving PV to the terawatt scale is the, is, the, is the objective, and I think that we're well on our way. So thank you very much, and I think I got eight minutes. Um, well, if you weren't enthused already, then um, I hope you are now. But uh, so the view from the, the group that's been right at the forefront over decades of, of PV and so many of those um, important technologies that were very high risk and that, that really I thought would never really make it. Um, and CIGS and Cadman Keller, they're, they're there, they're, they're big and they're important. So, well, well done, Greg, and um, thank you very much for your words today. Um, I've, I've um, volunteered you to to go upstairs and to um, be a target for staff and students and other visitors who want to come oh, uh, great. For, for half an hour after this because we'll have to get out here by, by the time the big hand gets to 12. <laughs> but, um, but we've got a few minutes now if, um, if you want to make some questions. Absolutely. Uh, can I, agree? I just wanted to ask you, uh, one of the problems is sometimes integrating different renewable technologies together. Everybody's working on their own little area and they don't often... Uh, you're talking about building integration there, maybe the idea of say something like solar thermal and PV being better integrated uh, uh, so you create greater efficiency so you lower that threshold of uh, cost effectiveness to the point where you don't have to reach uh, certain efficiency figures, you know, you can start operating commercially at a lower level. So just wondering, is there an overall umbrella group that you've got that maybe is looking at how to build the buildings of the future, integrating a whole bunch of these different uh, technologies, including PV, whatever it might be? Okay, so that's, uh, there's a lot of different ways to answer that. Um, my group just works on the device, the materials in the device. Now, it happens that my closing slide here shows NREL, and NREL really has become a living laboratory. It, it is this, these three buildings right here are, I think, the largest net zero energy buildings in the world. So this, this building uh, produces slightly more electricity than it uses, and 1,500 people reside in it. It's powered by PV. You have a lot of PV around this campus. You ask if there's kind of some sort of integrating kind of force, and I'd like to say that there is, but there's not. But there are, there are uh, funding vehicles that are kind of emerging that way. I ha happen to have uh, one of our... Uh, science fellows who works in my center who's on assignment at DOE he actually works for the agency ARPA-E if you've heard of that and uh, this is Howard Brands. Howard was, is, the, is the program manager for a new proposal that's generated a lot of excitement in the United States exactly about PV-CSP hybrids. Actually it's not even limited to PV-CSP it's PV hybridized with something and there's a lot of opportunities there. 
There hasn't been a lot of funding in this space, uh, but uh, a big block of RPE funding is getting ready to come out there. So I think you have thought leaders that emerge that are not really formally attached to the DOE. It doesn't come from government. It, it really comes from, from people who maybe wiggle their way into a position of influence and, and make a difference. We don't have an energy policy in the United States that addresses any of the things I just talked about. What's happening in the United States is 50 different states growing organically. And uh, we had a discussion earlier today about uh, you can live in one part of the United States and have absolutely no idea that, that PV is real. And then you can live in California where the whole load profile for the state has been inverted by rooftop PV just in the last 18 months. So the United States is a very diverse and crazy place. Um, and the Department of Energy has a lot of different funding vehicles. We're constantly attacked by our Congress. Funding is, 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 is it's why I have a lot more gray hair now because it's a constant problem. Um, there's not great thought leadership, I would argue, from the DOE, but there actually is a lot of thought leadership around the various institutions in the United States. So uh, it's not the best answer, but there's some pretty good answers. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of people that are also motivated by the, the, the potential for great wealth generation. And I've been around a lot of those people too. In fact, this gentleman, Eli, Elon Musk, is one of them. He owns Solar City, and Solar City is tearing up the, the P downstream PV market in the United States. They are growing at a, at a phenomenal rate. Um, their model is leasing PV to homeowners, much like leasing a car. And so they, they, there's no capital cost. The PV array gets put on the roof. So That's an upgrade later on. Uh, so I can't ask, answer a lot of questions. I don't know it about the details of their contract. I just know. In my neighborhood in Denver, solar city arrays are going up on all my neighbors' roofs, and they're, they, and along with some of their competitors, are responsible for what's happened in California. But integrating that with other systems has got to happen. The last thing I'll say, and then I have to shut up, this building over here is the latest addition to NREL's campus. It's the Energy Systems Integration Facility. It's a big laboratory investment that the DOE made at NREL precisely to try to solve a whole bunch of energy system integration problems. That is the big nut to crack, is to figure out how to integrate the energy systems. This place doesn't just deal in electricity, it deals in hydrogen, other low molecular weight fuels. It's all about energy and the renewable sources are where we're going to get that energy, but how we actually make it useful and integrate them all is the, big, the next big problem. Do we have time for another? We have, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, We've got a half an hour set aside, but we're going to go to room G22, which is in that corner of the building on ground floor, and it's a glass, like a glass box um, that uh, comes to the place. And, um, and we'll, just, as soon as we can pack up, we'll move there. So if anybody who can hang on then, um, please, please do bring your questions there. Okay. okay.